or into the anterior fontanelle, and have that backbiting, into which we will enlarge that ostium now. Once again, with an ostium size of like that, there would be no need to routinely enlarge it. But now I will insert the backbiting forceps for demonstration only and take away remnants of the uncinate process very carefully, not to create a lesion to the nasal lacrimal duct, which is anterior to that. And this, by the way, is a nice technique of resecting remnants of the uncinate if you had not done so with your first incision, like trying here if there's something left of the uncinate seal as I'm going up. Okay, so now we have a nice view into the maxillary sinus, and we can identify again the cause of the infraorbital in the roof of that sinus. I think you can see that very, very clearly and uh, can decide whether there's anything that needs to be done. Can I have the backbiting again? So in case we would have an accessory ostium in the posterior fontanelle, we would always try to enlarge that ostium at the expense, that's okay, at the expense, not at the expense, that ostium into that natural ostium to avoid that circulation of mucus, as I've shown you on the, on the, on the slide. So you easily can go in there and then continue with a upbiting forceps to remove that mucosa from up here. See, so you can create a very, very nice and wide ostium. I will not do so further, but there's no, not routinely any need for that. See, a huge and wide ostium. So what remains to be done? We've performed a total sphenoethmoidectomy without touching the middle turbinate, so you can leave this there a procedure like this is very, very rare. I will now show you, I think I need the spoon, uh, some of the points of danger. I have shown you the optic nerve. I have shown you the relation to the carotid artery, and we opened that on purpose. Once again, we have our insertion of the middle turbinate, and we have the anterior ethmoidal artery clearly outlined here. We have the posterior, and there is where I created a lesion to the papyrus lamina and the posterior ethmoid. Look at the dome of the ethmoid. If I palpate here, it is very hard to get through. I will try extremely hard. Now it works. So there is considerable force or power needed to break through superiorly. But this, once again, is a thing very rarely to occur. However, let's look at our anterior ethmoidal artery. Here you can see it very nicely as it swings across from the orbit, roof of the ethmoid, and leaves medially. And if we insert our instrument here, and this is a nicer case, and you can see I'm just holding the instrument with two fingers and applying only minimal pressure. And you see it disappears like in, in soft ice cream. So there's almost no resistance in that area. Once again, we have the anterior ethmoidal artery. This is insertion of the middle turbinate coming down, so we're well above the cribriform plate. So here we're looking straight into brain, anterior fossa, right up there. See, you can see the brain up there. So this is very easily done. So going up, once again, where's our middle turbinate? That's the insertion. So we would, did not go straight up, but we turned the instrument a little bit medially, and there the bone offers you least resistance. So this is an area of, of extreme danger. I will try to outline the anterior ethmoidal artery a little bit better. And there we are. You can nicely see it now anterior ethmoidal artery in its bony canal, and there it is extremely thin. So that's an area of danger. Um, the other area of danger is if you look, let me rotate my lens a little bit laterally, if you look to the papyrus lamina, the area of the ostium, and you palpate for this only a little bit too high, say over here, then you'll be in the, the upbiting please, in the orbit as well, and you will protrude orbital fat very easily, but as I told you, this is not a problem as long as you do not mistake this for um, uh, diseased mucosa. Even an amount like this can carefully be pushed back, not in two, but like that, put in a Maricel sponge or a resorbable package, tell your patient not to blow his nose, that's it. Maybe get some air in, in his lid or a small little bleeding in the canthus, but usually that's not a problem. Of course, if somebody goes on and takes out fat and rectus medius, rectus muscle and so on, this will mean problems. Finally now, there is one thing which yesterday I have not uh, forgotten to demonstrate. I will rotate my 
endoscope a little bit medially. And can I have the spoon again? So we are looking at the insertion of our middle turbinate once again. Middle turbinate is here. And remember or imagine you would routinely resect the middle turbinate. What happens? Let's go up here. And do you know these structures here? These are the olfactory fibers. One, two, many more back here. So if you resect the turbinate, you inadvertently will open or tear these olfactory fibers. And you know that the dura passes directly on into the perineurium of these fibers. So there will be mini CSF leaks, which may seal, but may in one or the other case give rise to um, a persisting CSF leak or even a, a meningitis in the consequence. So if ever possible, try to preserve that middle turbinate. I'm looking now up into the olfactory ridge.